Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to just pack up your life, put it into a four-wheel drive truck and then spend the rest of your time just traveling the world from country to country? Well, in this video, we're going to be talking to Marcus Tuck, who has done exactly that. Now the video is in three parts. The first part we're just going to take a brief look at the Iveco daily 4x4 that Marcus and his wife used to travel the world. Then there's going to be a short montage Marcus has put together of some of their video clips and then we're going to spend the rest of the video talking in detail, live recording of a webinar about um, exactly what it's like to travel the world using questions from myself and from the audience. Hope you enjoy it and learn something. So let's take a look at Marcus's truck, which is an Iveco daily 4x4. It is an off-road designed light truck and it is available in single cab form as you see there and also a double cab. Now here's some specs for it. It is permanent four wheel drive, which means it drives all four wheels all the time. So that's also what we term all wheel drive. I do a video on that explaining the difference between four wheel drive, all wheel drive, etc. It does have a centre differential lock. Um, when that isn't engaged, the torque split is 32% to the front, 68% to the rear. Um, it runs 37 inch tyres and they are single tyres as opposed to double tyres, which is what you want in an off road vehicle. Um, it has in effect a triple low range or triple range with a hundred to one reduction which is actually more than a rock crawler like the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon and there's a total of 24 forward gears. It has cross axle differential locks front and rear which are selectable. Um, this only comes in a six speed manual and the power plant is a diesel engine 130 kilowatts 430 Newton meters. So impressive specs, but really got to put that against something we already know. So let's take a look at what that looks like compared to a Ranger. Now this Iveco daily here isn't Marcus's, this is another one. Um, it's a dual cab version and that's my Ranger there to give you a size comparison. Now here's some stats. So the length is actually about the same. It's about uh, 5.4 meters for both vehicles. The width is the daily is a bit wider, about 200 mil wider than, than the range, but not even that actually, more like 150 mil wider. Um, height, that's where really the difference comes in because um, the daily is probably a half a meter taller than the Ranger. However, if you start to put roof racks, the suspension lift, bigger tires, etc., on the Ranger, then that starts to decrease um, as well in favor of the Iveco. But basically, the Iveco will, I think, always be taller. Now, weight-wise, unladen, the range is about 2250. Unladen, the Aveco, depending on which type you have, is around about 2700, which is actually about the same sort of weight as a Y62 Patrol or a, um, two, a Land Cruiser 200 series. Now, for payload, the, and this is really critical for any form of off-road touring, but particularly long-distance touring, the Ranger can only take about 950 kilograms, whereas the Iveco daily can take at least 1,800 kilograms if it's derated to a 4.5 tonne GVM on a car licence, or more like 2.5 um, tonnes if it's on a light rigid licence, so it can carry way more. Now the tray length, um, on you're, you're sort of pushing it at about 1800 mil with the Ranger, whereas you've got 2400 mil of space, and that's on the dual cab version um, for the uh, Iveco daily. Now the Ranger can tow three and a half thousand kilos. If you're lucky, if you set it up exactly right and you don't have hardly anything in it, the daily really can tow uh, three and a half thousand kilos. And the Ranger can only seat five, whereas the daily can seat six in dual cab form. Okay, so there's some other comparison photos. You can see the difference between the two. You can see really length, pretty much the same sort of thing there. Um, width a little bit wider and height is really where it's at. But because it's a forward control vehicle, which means that the um, driver sits pretty much over the front wheels, then you get a lot more space in the back. And thanks to Don and Cole for that image up there, comparing the daily to a Land Rover Defender old style um, 110. So that's the vehicle introduced. Next up is a clip Marcus has put together of the first five years of traveling. And then we're gonna to talk to him about exactly what it's like to do that round the world traveling.
did you come to actually be traveling the world full time in a four wheel drive? This is like the dream of everybody. How, how, how did you end up there? You sort of get out of bed one day and then go, oh, okay, I'm, I'm just going to set off. Sort of went down to the shops for milk and it's never came back. So, what's the story? Um, well, we used to fly into Africa and hire a Land Rover with a roof tent and do sort of self drive safaris, which we, uh, we quite enjoyed. And we kind of realized that. Well, we weren't really doing Africa a justice, you know, going in for two weeks at a time, we weren't seeing enough. Um, we were around in the Middle East at the time and we were, uh, we'd managed to pay off the mortgage on the house and we were renting it out. And I had a small pension from the Air Force and we kind of did a bit of maths and thought, hang on a minute, I think we can probably afford to live on the road. So uh, then we started doing a bit of research into vehicles and um, decided, yeah, let's go for it. And uh, we decided to retire early and uh, have a nomadic lifestyle. And that was uh, seven years ago. So you basically had a bit of a pension, saved up early, rented your house, and then that's your income for travelling around the world. Yeah, and actually when you go on the road, as long as you've got a reasonable vehicle, um, the cost of living is, uh, is reasonably, slow, reasonably low. I mean, okay, you're going to have food, you're going to have food wherever you are. Uh, there's obviously fuel for the vehicle. Uh, but I mean, we've been in Canada since March, and I think we've actually been in the campsite uh, three times in the last sort of eight, nine months. Um, wild camping is, is, is easy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the cost of living actually on the road is, is considerably less than when you're actually living in a house. Okay. Now, but when you're, when you I mean, the Iveco Daily is not a small vehicle, but on the other hand, compared to a house, it's minuscule. So you, you don't have all the possessions. If I look at my house here, I've got a garage full of stuff and I've got all sorts of other things here. Yet you have to leave all of that behind. Do you not miss it? Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the big things. I mean, you, you see a lot of the forums, they're going about overlanding vehicles, you know, you've got to make them as light as possible. You've got to strip everything out. You've got to go down to the absolute bare essentials. And that's okay. If you're doing a short six months, maybe a year trip. I mean, we've been on the road for seven years. Um, what the Avico gives us with a li larger capacity is the ability to carry extra hobby items. Uh, mm. so we, we do have hobbies. Um, it's quite important to have them. I mean, for example, when COVID struck, we were up in Whitehorse. And we were locked down in the business center car park for 12 weeks. And it was minus 31 centigrade outside uh, mm. that time of year. We were actually trying to get up into the Arctic and get across some of the uh, ice bridges mm. to get up to Tuk Tuk Tuk. So when that kind of thing happens, it is quite important to have more than just the bare essentials in the vehicle, uh, just to keep, keep you sane, really. Yeah, okay. Is there anything that you particularly wish you could take with you but can't? Uh, yeah, bigger workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Now, um, you're something of a legend in Iveco daily four by four circles because you do a lot of maintenance yourself and I've seen you change timing belts and things like that as well. Um, was that something you had to learn how to do or you're a professional mechanic or what? No, I mean, I, I used to mess around with cars. I joined the Air Force as a radar technician. So that kind of taught me my electronics. I did five years as a radar technician and then I became an aircrew. Uh, but I've always messed around with cars. Minis were my thing. Uh, I bought an old 1972 Mini 1275 GT, complete yeah. rust bucket, bought a brand new body shell and then basically built the thing from the ground up. And then I started messing around with suspension, engines and gearboxes. And yeah, just that's kind of how I learned. And of course, back in those days, it was super easy because there was no electronics on the engine. So you just got in there and filed things away and had things machined and messed around with the timing and saw the effect and then play around with suspension geometry and Oh, that wasn't very good around the corner. And that's yeah. how I learned, basically, by trial and error. And so with the Iveco Daily, it doesn't have the best reputation for rock-solid reliability. Did you know that at the time when you bought it? Well, what I'll say is I've done 232,000 kilometres through 48 countries over seven years. And the longest I've been stuck on the side of the road is just under an hour replacing a radiator hose. Wow. So... What I've seen in Australia is there's a bit of bad press. Some of the garages didn't really know what they were doing with the vehicle. And a lot of people modify the vehicle, uh, which isn't necessarily a good thing. You, you'll see on the forums, people will slag off the clutches saying that these clutches aren't up to anything. What they've done is they've had a tune on the engine and they've taken it from 400 Newton meters to torque up to 450. You know, when Avico did that on their other version of the three liter engine, they put a one inch larger diameter clutch in. So, you know, if you're going to start tuning the engine and getting more power out of it, you've got to accept that the drive line is going to need modifying as well. Uh, so I'm still on the original clutch and I'm driving at 5,900 kilos, you know, 232,000 kilometers. 
the guys with the tunes, some of them are only getting 25,000 kilometers out of the clutch and they're saying the Avico clutch is rubbish. I don't think the Avico clutch is rubbish at all. It's up to the job for what it was designed for. You change that design, you're going to have problems. And that's, that's my take on it. And as an overlander, I want to try and keep the vehicle as standard as possible because that's the most reliable configuration. I don't need to be the fastest person in the world. I, I, I joke over here in the States, in Canada, that, hey, I'm, I'm probably the slowest vehicle on the road. I mean, I've got a three-liter engine with a 13,000-pound vehicle, and they're all laughing because they've got six, eight-liter engines in a small runaround, you know? So, yeah, you've got to accept what it is. And I don't think the reliability is as bad as it's made out to be in Australia quite a lot of the time. Mm. Well, yeah, look, I mean, Australians are noted for massively overloading their vehicles and modifying them and they're wondering why parts break. So if you're preaching the um, do not modify your vehicle, well, you're not going to get a visa here. I'm sorry, they're just going to turn you away at the border. Um, <laughs> you, you know, yeah, particularly, yeah. So, but look, yeah. I've, really... I've done a few modifications. I have done quite a few modifications. But yeah, there's, there's some things I kind of like messing around with the engine you just want to keep that thing working as reliably as possible yeah look i must admit i share the same philosophy um i think that most four-wheel drives these days have more than enough power and if you're too slow on the road learn how to drive that's my philosophy and keep it as, as standard as possible yeah so let's talk about the four-wheel drive capability of the iveco have you um what sort of serious four-wheel driving have you done how, how has it compared as you've seen to maybe other vehicles as as you've been on the roads there yeah, I mean, my, my background on the four-wheel drive side is obviously hiring Land Rovers and stuff in Africa and doing quite a lot of there. Out in the Middle East for the five years, we had Toyota Fortunas. Uh, my wife and I, we both had them uh, with the four-liter V6 petrol engine because fuel doesn't cost anything out in Doha. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, we thought, okay, we're going to get an Avico daily. We chose it because we wanted something that would fit down a car track but has the higher load capacity. And we were thinking, okay, we're going to have to really hold back on what we do off-road wise because it obviously it's a big vehicle and so it won't be as capable what a mistake that was it was far more capable than Toyota Fortuna um, I would say other than doing traverses because we've got a large motorhome on the back it will outperform a Land Rover in most off-road scenarios uh, the, the, the real advantage is okay it's, it's solid axles front and rear it's got three diff locks as standard uh, it even has a switch on the dashboard to turn off the engine cooling fan when you go through deep water for, for deep fording uh, with the low range as well, we've effectively got 24 forward, four reverse gears, and 100 to one is the ratio in the in the lowest gear. So I mean, from a crawling point of view, you know, and you can use the cruise control um, in low range as well. So if you're in a really rocky area and you're trying to find your way through, you can plug the cruise control in at three or four kilometers an hour, and, and you just you just bounce up and down in your air in your suspended seat, and you just have to worry about the steering. So. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an incredible vehicle off-road. It really is capable. So now, a question from Paul Cox is, I assume your truck is right-hand drive. How do you get on the States and Canada with that? I've actually got a left-hand drive. Uh, the nice thing ah. with the UK is you can register left or right-hand drive. It's not an issue. Uh, when we did our research, we found there's um, quite a few, well, there's a few countries in the world which don't let right-hand drives in. Um, in Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, uh, Nicaragua can be a bit funny. Um, Saudi Arabia used to be a problem, although I think it's opening up. But basically, we had the option to go left or right-hand drive, so we actually went left-hand drive. Uh, then we shipped to Africa, and we spent a year driving around Africa on the left-hand side of the road, so my steering wheel was on the wrong side. But the nice thing with the daily is you're so high up, you see over the top of all the cars, and you see over the top of, sort of Ford Transit uh, sprinter-sized vehicles, you can normally see over the roof of them. So actually... Being sat on the wrong side isn't a problem. We don't go fast enough to overtake anything anyway. Yeah. Yeah, look, my experience, I've driven all combinations of left and right-hand drive a fair bit, and you get used to it. The big problem with, with it is when no one else is around on the roads and it's just you, and then you might migrate onto the wrong side of the road at that point. But as if there's traffic and everything else, it's, uh, it's not normally too much of an issue there as well. Yeah, yeah you pull out on a T-junction, that's normally the worst, because when you turn on the T-junction, it's very easy to go onto the yeah. wrong lane. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing a lot of solo um, four-wheel driving then, so which means that um, you have to figure out uh, solo recovery. What means have you got of doing solo recovery and what stories have you got about doing solo recovery? Uh, we've got a winch on the front, a 16.5 TI worn winch. Um, quite a bit of pull there. Got a synthetic cable on that. Obviously gives a bit more safety factor and obviously make it easier to handle. We've got four sand ladders on the back of the vehicle. Uh, they are two meters long by about 50 centimeters. They're five millimeter aluminium. And then we've got a selection of shackles and 
straps and ropes, uh, quite like the nylon ropes and also a kinetic energy recovery rope. Uh, generally, we've, well, yeah, we've, ne we've never had to have someone help us out. We've always managed to get ourselves out of it. Um, even in Chile, we got stuck uh, very deep right up to the chassis rails uh, on a beach. It wasn't sand. It was actually volcanic ash and there was a fresh water uh, stream going through. And when we drove through it one way, it was no problem. We turned around, came back the other way and um, yeah, we just bolted straight in. So that was a few hours of uh, digging and a little bit of winching. But um, yeah, it's, it's surprising actually when you've got the three diff locks in and you've got four sand ladders, you've, uh, we tend to find that we just need a little bit of pull from the winch just to make the tires bite onto the sand ladders. Because if, you, if you're resting on your chassis, you, know, you, you can dig as much as you like and put the sand ladder in there. The wheels are just going to spin next to it. So we find that we've got a little ground anchor just designed for a Land Rover, nothing designed for a seven ton vehicle or six ton vehicle like we are. And we find that actually that provides enough traction, even in soft sand, to just let the tires grip the sand ladders. And then as soon as those tires are biting on the sand ladders, we jump out of the hole, it's no problem. Okay, and what sort of tire pressures do you run on road and off road? Uh, my front axle is at about 2,200 2, kilos. My rear axle is at 3,700 kilos. So on the front on road, I'm running around 43 to 45 PSI and on the back, I'm running around 73 PSI. Uh, if I go onto a track, I'll drop the fronts down to 25 and the rears down to 45. And if I'm going onto really soft stuff, normal sand, I'd run at those sort of track pressures. But if it's really soft stuff, I'll drop the front down to about 15 in the rear to 20. And it, if it's really, really dire, I'll go down to 10 PSI front and rear. Yeah, that, that's about what we do in, in large vehicles. Yeah, okay. And um, you've been through pretty soft sand in, in those sort of conditions down at sort of 15 or 10? Yeah, yeah. Um, we did uh, Le Swiss Maranhensis, which is in Brazil. We, uh, we did 100 kilometres, uh, pretty much all of it in low range and uh, with deflated tyres going through very deep water. We had a bow wave halfway up the bonnet, which is about 1.7 metres. So um, with the, the water depth must have been about 1 metre 20, I would have said. Um, and yeah, we used 48 litres of fuel for that 100 kilometres. <laughs> yeah, a bow wave 1.7 metres up, you wouldn't want to do that in anything smaller than a daily, would you? Not really, no. <laughs> if you no. kind of want up the windscreen of a Land Rover. Not yeah, really. that, that, that would be pretty much lapping at the snorkel there as well, yeah. Okay, yeah. now, um, what's the uh, width of your tyres? Um, talk to us about um, the, what sort of width tyres you run there relative to the vehicle. They're 255-100R16 Michelin XZLs. If you actually measure the width of the tread block, it's only 210. The 255 is actually the width of the fattest part of the tyre. So they, I think everybody will class those as skinnies, which I like. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, so if it's, even if it was 255, let alone 210, I mean, we've got vehicles here running 285s and, and even potentially wider. Um, but yet you're seeming to do okay on an incredibly narrow tire. Yeah. I mean, what you find is on the road, you want a nice skinny tire. It gives you very little drag. So you've got fuel economy there. Um, when it's really wet and rainy, your aquaplane speed is a lot higher than it would be with a fatter tire. And when you deflate the tire, obviously with a hundred profile sidewall, you, you can deflate a long way and so I, I can actually I've got some figures here I, I can go my normal road footprint is uh, 714 centimeters squared and I can I can deflate down to give myself a, a thousand and seventy three centimeters squared footprint so that's uh, that's one and a half times the footprint mm. by deflating but I'm not increasing the width of the tire so I'm not getting all the extra drag and I think that's one of the big things a lot of people don't realize you get your car, you put your big tires on, you put your fat tires on, no problem at all. You go in the sand, you blast around, it's no problem at all because you've got a huge power to weight ratio. When you've got a vehicle up at your gross vehicle mass and the power to weight ratio, I mean, I've got 170 horsepower and I'm trying to push 5,900 kilos through the sand. Having a fat tire, you're just going to suck up so much of your energy. Mm. Um, and when you've got marginal power, you know, that's where you really struggle. I mean, one of, one of my normal catchphrases, which really gets a quite, quite interesting conversation going is, if you have to lose, use low range when you're in the sand on the flat, you haven't let your tyres down enough. And yeah. I get quite a lot of argument from the car guys going, oh, no, I've got to use low range all the time. I'm going, well, you haven't let your tyres down or well, you've got ridiculously fat tyres. Then they say, oh, no, I'm going to use low range because I don't want to strain my vehicle. It's like, 
Well, actually, using your low range, you've just increased your torque going through your drive shafts and your axles. If you're ever going to overstress your drive line, it's when you're in low range. Yeah, sure, your engine isn't revving very hard. It doesn't sound like it's working very hard, but you've just doubled or tripled the stress you're putting into your transmission. So actually, I would rather lower my tire pressures and uh, manage to stay in high range. It's uh, that personally, I think is a lot less stress on the vehicle. That's actually really good. I like that. So yeah, if on the flat, um, you've got to go to low range. I think I think that's that's not a bad rule of thumb. Actually, I quite quite like that. I'm t I totally agree with about skinny tires. And interesting thing is that um, contact patch is the same as a fat tire, just a different shape. And um, I, I'm actually going to be proving that shortly because no one believes me when I say that. But um, you know, like no one believed me about winching physics until I actually did demonstrations. Yeah. So I'll just prove all the naysayers there. So yeah, that's great. Now I've got a few questions coming through. So let, let, let's crack those off. Do you okay. have bead locks for the low tire pressures? No, I don't. Um, they, they hold in quite nicely. Go below 10 PSI, I, I wouldn't really risk it. I did in, in Doha in, on the Fortuna, I'd go down a little bit lower sometimes on a really hot day. But generally, no, I find 10 PSI, it's fine. Um, if, you, if you've let your tyres down to that, that kind of pressure, I'm not going to drive faster than 20 kilometres an hour uh, because the, the tyre is just going to overheat in no time at all at those kind of pressures. And then obviously, you've got to be a bit careful with your turn radius as well. You don't want to be cranking a, a lot of turning on. Okay, so this time for those aren't sure what bead locks are, when you run your tyres at very low pressure, the, the, what keeps the tyre on the rim is basically air pressure. So the less pressure you have, the more likely the tyre is to separate from the rim. So you have a mechanical device which literally fixes the tyre to the rim. Um, and that's what a bead lock is. They're not legal for running on the road in Australia. Um, and they do make the tyre more difficult to come on and off. But yeah, um, they're not often used and Marcus doesn't use them. So next question is... Um, why did you select a small truck and not a Land Rover or similar? Um, did previous experience play a part in the decision? You've kind of touched on that already, though. So It's payload, basically. Um, we've done a lot of holidays where we've done the roof tent thing with the Land Rover. Absolutely fantastic. No problem at all. Um, and then one year we were down in Swaziland. We were up in the hills and it was we'd got on the aeroplane to fly down to africa it's 45 degrees in doha we got off the aircraft in joburg and it's one degree and we're in a tent and it's raining and it's freezing cold and it was like north wales in winter when the zebra walked past so it's like okay we're not in north wales we're definitely in africa but it was freezing the uh, roof tent had leaked during the day while we've been driving through the kind of monsoon rains all the mattress was wet through the middle we had the awning out we were trying to get the fire going and a german couple rocked up next to us in a truck like we have now they didn't even have the decency to close the blinds. We could see inside. They were they were there in their t-shirts. They were cooking their uh, their dinner on the stove inside, and we were thinking, yeah, you know, that might be a good idea. Yeah. So we then started looking at building a, a box on the back of a Land Rover, and I uh, started looking at the fuel I want to carry, the tools I wanted to carry, and the mass just didn't add up. It just yeah. it wouldn't have the load capacity that we wanted for the comfort we wanted. Uh, then we started looking at the bigger trucks, and we realised they wouldn't fit down some of the trails we love doing in Africa. Uh, and then we came across the daily and it, it fitted the the, uh, the criteria. It had the, the higher low capacity. So you could, you were a small truck. You could, you could have a comfortable box on the back, um, but it was small enough to fit down car tracks. Yeah. And that, that basically was what sold it to us. So that kind of answers Alexander's question about um, wanting a bigger truck, because I guess there's always that trade off there. Yes, you'd want a massive truck, but then it costs more. It won't fit where you want to go. Is then um, I think your, your point about the space is really good, because um, if we look at what we do in Australia, I mean, we're packing vehicles and then we're putting GVM upgrades on and we're towing trailers. We're kind of overloading them. So what I'm trying to do now is point people in the direction of light trucks like Cantors are popular over here and Dailies and Hinos and, and Fusos and um, Isuzus, um, rather than try and overload a Ranger or a 79 series, just do the job properly and get the truck built, built for it. And you get much, much greater load space as well, so it makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I mean, my Fortuna had a service interval of 5,000 kilometres. Uh, well, it was 10,000, but the, 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 the garages recommended 5,000 in, in the conditions. In a Vico, it's 40,000, and they recommend 20,000 in the off-road environment. You know, so I've, I'm, I'm servicing it a quarter as often as I would the Toyota, uh, and that makes a big difference. And, and it's because it's truck engineering, you know, the chassis and things like that, they're big, they're strong, um, yeah. and they can take a bit more abuse, which is good. I mean, I don't think I'd like to run a car around at maximum uh, weight all the time because they're not really designed for that they, they have a maximum weight on them but they're not designed to be run 24 7 like that whereas a truck they are i mean they're a commercial vehicle yeah. 
any, anybody who's operating a commercial vehicle, if they're not operating at maximum weight, they've bought the wrong vehicle. So they design from the ground up to be operated at their maximum weight. And it's interesting that quite a lot of the guys in Australia are running them around as backies and they complain about the suspension, how terrible it is and the ride's awful. Well, it's because they haven't got enough weight on the back. Stick a Land Rover on the back, give it a little bit of ballast, you know, and the road holding improves straight away because they're designed to be operated at maximum weight. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's only maximum weight, let alone a GVM upgrade on, on top of that. So, yeah, just get a job. But I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to, to have a vehicle like that if you're going to be living in it pretty much, well, literally full time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, next question from Paul Cox um, Does the track, um, so let's talk about the mechanics, um, or not mechanics much, um, the, the logistics of moving from country to country, because most of the um, uh, listeners will be in one country, they'll be familiar with wandering about that. But when you've actually got to take your vehicle from country to country, then you've got to deal with potentially different road regulations, certainly different insurance. Um, all sorts of different permits there. Talk us through some of the complexities of that and what a Carnet de Passage is. Okay, the, uh, the Carnet de Passage is basically a guarantee for the country that you're going to take the vehicle out of the country. And if you don't take the vehicle out of the country, they've got a part of your Carnet as a receipt that they can claim against so they can get any import duties and taxes which are due on that vehicle. So Australia, for example, requires a Carnet de Passage if we go there. Uh, there are different motoring organizations around the world which will issue them. So you, you get them from your home country. Yeah. Uh, and then the value, the, the actual document costs around 250, 300 pounds. So what's that? $600, five, 600 Australian dollars, something like that. But then you need to have a guarantee that if the, if the carne is claimed against, someone's got to pay out that money. So either you have to give a bank deposit uh, for the value, value which the carne needs to be to cover the taxes or you can get insurance, um, or sometimes there's a flat fee kind of thing. It depends on the, on the issuer. So that's how you do it with some countries. That's certainly what we did going around Africa. Um, South America is great. They don't bother with that. They just have a temporary import permit. So you just arrive at the border and you fill in some papers and they say, okay, you can keep your vehicle in this country for three months. And then you have to export the vehicle. Uh, some of them monitor it closely and they actually put something in your passport. Others don't bother with that. So you can kind of get in and out of the country. Uh, from the insurance point of view, trying to get global insurance, we did try. Uh, the policy was quoted as 10% of the vehicle value a year. Um, so, you know, that's pretty steep. Uh, what you can do, though, is you can get third-party insurance. You c there are a few companies around which will give you third-party insurance globally, but generally you buy the insurance on the, country, in, on the border as you arrive at the country. Or sometimes uh, when we went into Bolivia, for example, that was a great place to buy a policy because they gave us a policy which covered Bolivia and then all the neighboring countries, which in South America, Bolivia is right in the middle. So that, that was a great policy because it allowed us to then jump across into all the other countries without a problem. Uh, Ecuador, you can't get insurance. They don't do third party insurance. They basically, the government put a levy on the fuel and if there's an accident, they cover the cost of any health care. That's another thing which you need to be careful with the insurance, with the third party insurance. A lot of people think it's like in a civilized country. Oh, we've got third party insurance. So, you know, someone else hits me or I hit them. They're damaged for their vehicles covered by the third party insurance. It's not the case. Most third party insurance, which you buy at the border, purely covers health care. It's up to you to discuss with the person what the damage was and how much it's going to cost you to fix it. In a lot of these countries, it doesn't really matter because the vehicle's not worth more than two or three hundred dollars. But it's kind of big boys rules out there. And it is a risk you have to be kind of aware of and temper your driving accordingly. So um, have you had any accidents? No. Um, well, we've been parked and it's three o'clock in the morning. There was an almighty bash and the truck swung as a drunk driver drove into the back of us at about 20 mile an hour. But um, four five millimeter thick uh, sand ladders are very effective. His Land Rover, well, I don't think it was a Land Rover, it was some sort of four by four. It was completely crumpled up, his headlights pointing up in the sky and um, I didn't have a scratch on me, but we were, we were parked under a street light, but they have heavily tinted windows, which is a, a great thing to do at night. And then after a few beers, they're, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah okay so that's the logistics then um what do you do when the vehicle needs to go um from country to country because you're not going to air freight it if you simply put it on a container and ship it do you fly across or do you boat across or what or? uh it depends on the on the shipping line um we ship down to south africa and back again we put the vehicle on a roll-on roll-off ship and we flew 
when we went from Germany to South America, we got a cabin on the, on the cargo ship. So we had five weeks on a cargo ship, uh, which is an interesting experience. And one of the biggest eye openers there is seeing how they handle shipping containers. Everybody thinks, oh, yeah, I want to ship my vehicle in a, in a shipping container because they've seen these pictures of Rotterdam where there's these massive cranes which lift the container on and off the ship. Uh, when you get to Africa, they, they use the cranes which are on board the ship to, to lift the containers on and off, and they're not container cranes. They're just a regular crane with a swivel on the end. So they pick the container up, they swing it over the side of the ship. It's not at the right angle, so they smack it in the side of the ship to make it spin. And then when it's at the right orientation, they drop it from about a foot onto the deck that stops the turn, then they lift it actually into the final position. And um, yeah, it's interesting to see. <laughs> so is the vehicle strapped down inside the container? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, actually, where, if you're shipping by container, yeah, you'll, you'll go into the container. You'll normally uh, take some wood with some nails. You'll, you'll nail some kind of chocks into the ground, to hold the vehicle in the place. And then you put some, you'll put some tie down straps. If you're going on a uh, row row ship, then um, I've actually got a photo somewhere of our, our truck in one. I'll just uh, try and bring that up. They, they just tie it down. Um, okay, let me try and... Uh, so with a, with a row row, okay. um, do you drive it on and off or do you have to give them the keys? You have to give them the key. Well, when we went on the, uh, when we went on the ship with the, uh, with the vehicle, then we actually drove it on in part to ourselves. And you can see there in the photo, that's it strapped down in the in the in the basically it's like a just like a cross channel ferry just like a regular ferry right um but normally you have to hand the keys over and they will drive the vehicle on on for you so what's quite important in our truck design is from the, the box in the back where we live in going into the cab we have a climb through with a secure door so yeah. basically we can throw all our stuff in the back and then um we lock that door they have the keys for the front so they can drive the vehicle on and off and all our stuff is secure in the rear of the vehicle. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also guess if you needed to hand it over to any mechanics for any reason, you could do the same thing as well. Yeah, I, I do everything though. I, I don't yeah. hand over to mechanics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you do, but, but just in case we, um, someone else had to, yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about um, uh, dangers then, because, um, you know, you, you are travelling into countries which have um, high crime rates, um, potentially not, particularly well up there on the police um, purity front, etc. cetera. Ha um, what sort of dangers are you facing and how do you mitigate those risks? Uh, I, I think it's overplayed by a lot of people. I mean, I, I can ham it up and I can make it sound like, oh, we're the most adventurous people on the planet. But actually 99.9% .9 of everybody we've ever met has been perfectly law-abiding, fantastic, really friendly. The truck actually helps because it's interesting and they're, they're really keen to come over and have a chat. And it, it's been a great experience. Uh, we did have a policeman try and bribe us in Zimbabwe. He said I had committed some terrible road offence and it was a Friday. So because uh, the fine was going to be so big, I'd have to go to, to the uh, court on the Monday. But they'd have to impound the vehicle for the weekend, you know, and it's going to be like 300 US dollars is the fine. So it's going to be really terrible. And how could uh, he help me? So I just said, well, I don't know where the police station is. So if you can show me the way to the police station, we'll put the vehicle in the pound and uh, we can sort out all the paperwork. He was like, you don't understand me. This is this going to really mess you up? This is going to cause, no, 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 I'm quite happy. You just show me the way to the police station. Well, this went on for about 15 minutes and eventually he got bored and he went, oh, you're not understanding me. Just go, oh, okay, thank you, bye. And just wait them out. If you're, if you're traveling, you're not in a hurry. Then, you know, the, the, the thing to do is make sure your vehicle is legal. Make sure all your documents are legal and make sure you are completely squeaky clean. Then you've got nothing to worry about. And if you've got nothing to worry about, you can sit there. And the bottom line is, if they're trying to milk you for some money, it's because maybe you're slightly dodgy or you've got something slightly wrong. And that's what they prey on. And if you've got all your ducks in a row, then you're bulletproof and you can be quite confident about it. And as soon as they realize you're confident about it, they're kind of like, mm, I'll get the next tourist that comes along who might not be so confident. So that's how we deal with um, bribing with police. Uh, we had one, one attempt in um, Peru as well, but we, again, we just, we just played it out exactly the same way. So we've never, played, never paid a bribe. Uh, in the fuel stations in Africa, one of the normal scams is they'll tell you this, they'll get you out of the car to do the fuel pump or go out and chat to them while they're doing the fuel pump. And then someone will point out there's something wrong with your tires on the other side of the vehicle and get you to go around there. And while you're going around there, they'll open the driver's door and try and half inch anything that's kind of sitting around or they'll try and get in the passenger door by distracting you some other way. That's quite a 
normal ploy. They did get a GPS off of us in Namibia uh, that way. We learnt our lessons. So uh, whenever we go to a fuel station, I get out to do the fuel and um, Julie locks the vehicle. So she's, she's safe in the vehicle. Uh, but that's, that's the only occasion we've had of that. Um, we've met other people who are armed and things like that. We had one guy, we were going through um, Copper Canyon in Mexico, which is um, a no-go for the police in the army. And we were chatting to them saying, well, can we go through? Because we knew it was a kind of drug cartel area. And they said, well, yeah, as a tourist, you should be all right, but we can't go there. Just kind of check in with the people when you go through. So that's what we did. We, we took local advice. We stopped in the villages. There might be a guy stood on the corner with a machine gun over his shoulder and a walkie-talkie. We'd just say, hey, look, we're stupid tourists. We just want to go down this road. Is that all right? He goes, yeah, sure, no problem. So as long as they know who you are, um, it's not a problem. And you've just got to be sensible and you, you kind of get a bit of a feel for it. But you can't go around the world thinking everybody's bad. They're not. The, everybody's good, actually. It's really rare to meet, meet a bad egg, as it were. And um, yeah, people are interested to meet you as you are to meet them. And it's, it's a really positive thing. I, I can't stress that enough. Hmm. Yeah, but, but there have been some things you've done to ward it off. I mean, you learned that thing about um, locking the car when um, you're doing the fuel. Um, and, you know, there's probably other things you can do not to get into trouble there in the yeah. first place, because that's really what it is. It's more about stay, yeah. taking things yeah. to stay out of trouble as opposed to fighting your way excitingly out of it. Yeah, we put smash and grab film on the, uh, the front windows of the vehicle. Um, it's quite a common supermarkets especially in argentina it's a classic they just put a brick through your window they grab whatever they can get to i think one of the advantages with the daily is it's so high off the ground they can't walk past and see what's in there so yeah. it's hard for them to just kind of smash a window and grab it because even if they smash the window they've got to climb up quite a long way to get in yeah. uh we've put stainless steel plates around the front door locks just so that you can't do the old screwdriver through the lock and jemmy it out kind of thing just to make it a little bit hard you're just trying to make your vehicle look a little bit tougher than the next one the Mexican police were great. Every time they stopped us at a road check, which is one of them, they're just going to go, is this thing armoured? And we're like, oh, yeah, you know. It, obviously, it's not. It's plastic at the back, you know. A bullet will go straight through one side to the other, no problem at all. But, hey, if, if they want to think it's bulletproof, then, um, yeah, crack on, you know. It's a bit more protection for us. Yeah, yeah. And I think what you're saying there is basically there's probably maybe a lot of trouble you haven't had because you've taken all of these precautions. Um, and I've heard the same from other um, overlanders as well. So by the way, what is your view of the term overlanding? Because in Australia, you know, it's not a term we tend to use. Um, we tend to just call it trips or four wheel driving or something like, like that. Um, but America seems very big on this sort of world expedition overlanding stuff. What, what's your view of it? Yeah, we've started using the word overlanding because traveling through, we've been in the Americas now for five years. And it, it's a very common term amongst Americans. But I mean, Americans might be, they might be in Texas and they might drive to California. And for them, and that's a big kind of overlanding adventure, you know, yeah. even if they're just going away for the weekend. So I don't know. I mean, we're vehicle based expedition it's not even an expedition we're, we're basically on holiday we're driving around the world having a good time in a vehicle so yeah we use the term overlanding I, I wouldn't like to try and kind of give it a different a proper definition or anything but yeah we're, we're, we're traveling by vehicle yeah and, yeah, uh, yeah so you've driven what 48 countries um now every country interestingly enough it seems to think they have the worst drivers in the world but we are now speaking to a man who can actually give us an informed opinion as to who the worst drivers in the world are. So give us your worst three and best three. Ecuadorian bus drivers. They just need to be locked up. I mean, they are just ridiculous. They'll come down a road. You can be in front of them. They will pull out. They'll put their horn on. And that is for you to slow down because they haven't actually got the power to overtake you. And they'll do that on a blind bend. I mean, they are just lethal. Um, other countries, they're the ones that really stood out, actually. Most of the other countries, I mean, having lived in the Middle East for five years, I mean, we went on holiday to um, Tanzania and the hire company were going, oh, you've got to be really careful here. You know, the driving's crazy. And we're like, hey, we've just come from Doha. You know, this is, your Tanzanians are driving really sensibly. So, yeah, you, you kind of get used to it. I, th I think the thing is, if, my father taught me just treat every other person on the road as a complete idiot. You won't go wrong, you know, and just expect the unexpected. And that's it. Drive defensively. Um, don't be in a hurry. D never drive at night. That's a real no, no. Um, and yeah, just be, just be careful. Um, Texas, absolute nightmare. Red traffic lights don't seem to mean anything to most of them. They'll quite happily drive through a red light. Um, 
which is quite a surprise. You'd think the Americans would be fairly careful, but they're not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. there's, there's different things. I mean, there, there's good drivers and there's bad drivers all over the world. You just got to yeah. just be careful. Just mm -hmm. yeah. So now, when you're um, traveling, um, this might be slightly too personal, but I'm going to um, you can decline to answer it. So, you know, um, it sort of I think that for any relationship, going on holiday is actually a really good litmus test because if you can do that or go through some adversity where things go wrong and it hasn't quite worked out and then you both come out the other side and you haven't stabbed each other, you're probably on for a pretty good thing. But five, seven years traveling the world, I mean, um, how does that go? Yeah, we get asked that quite a lot. We normally say kind of like, well, we'll keep going until we get bored or we kill each other. Because, um, yeah, we are literally on top of each other. It's a small vehicle uh, and we, we live in here for seven years. And I say up in Whitehorse, we were in lockdown for 12 weeks and you couldn't even go around town, you know. So you were really working back. You, you have to be tolerant of each other. Um, yeah, we have arguments and we have grumps and one of us will go off for a walk and come back sort of 20 minutes later having cooled off. But that's normally what we do. We might be grumpy with each other for a day, but you know, you make up. And it, yeah, you just got to be tolerant of each other. That's that's the most important thing. And Judy's used to putting up with me, and she's fairly easy to put up with too. Yeah, that's <laughs> luckily crazy. she's not sat next to me, so I can get away with it. <laughs> what well, what sort of people have you met as you've been um, um, traveling the world? Do people just come up and want to start a conversation, or um, and add, what, what are your observations of people who sort of you make contact with? Yeah, we, we, we met a lot of travellers that say, oh, you want to be covert, you know, you want to have one of these stealth campers so you can park up in town and not be met. And don't put your web address on the side of the vehicle, you know, because you're going to get all these nutters kind of get in touch with you and give you a hassle. None of that at all. Mm. We, ha we like having a pretty unique vehicle. Uh, it starts conversations. People come over and chat to us about it. Having the web address on the side is great. People will email us or they'll take photos of us and then kind of contact us on Instagram saying, hey, I was driving through town behind you tomorrow you know there's some great places here you know drop us a line and we'll we'll get a bit of a chat going and they'll tell us about some local places we didn't know about they're not in the tour tour guides uh, and having having the unique vehicle you know you stop somewhere great four by four has come up and kind of have a chat about it uh, and you, you get into conversations and that's the best thing you can do you start chatting to the locals you know they invite you to events and things like that and you get to see a lot more than you would if you were just purely getting the the tour guide books out and going oh yeah okay we're going to go to Machu Picchu, you know, oh, great. Okay. But actually you find out about 20 or 30 different things on the way. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, if somebody was considering emulating you um, and they were going to get uh, another full drive truck and then um, sort of set off on this 48 country tour of the world, what, what, and you've probably been asked this a bit. So um, what advice would you give them to do and not do with the benefit of hindsight and experience? Keep the vehicle as standard as possible. Um, get on the forums, see what the common faults are. Every vehicle has a common fault, even the Toyotas. Everybody says they're the most reliable vehicle in the world. I've owned them, they do break. Find out what the common faults are. Find out if there's any specialist tools um, and try and carry those. And if there's any unusual spares uh, or unusual filters or something, carry those. Get a workshop manual because even if you're not going to do the work, it makes it a lot easier in a foreign country with someone who's not familiar with the vehicle to have a manual and be able to show them the job you want doing or for them to tell you, oh, your problem is because of this bit. And if you don't both speak the same language, it's much easier to have a book with pictures in it and he can show you that it's the such and such a bracket on the underside of the vehicle or whatever. Mm. So that's really useful. If you can get a parts catalogue, do that. And I, I'm, I'm actually always surprised by how many people I meet traveling who know nothing about car maintenance not even the basics and and sadly quite a lot of them get taken to the cleaners when they do have a problem they go to a garage and these garages know that they they've only got to get the car a thousand kilometers down the road and they're never going to come back so they do some pretty shoddy work and charge them through the nose so try and my, my take on it is try and get some of the maintenance you know try and learn how to do the maintenance yourself i don't know whether you've got a local garage you can go to get them to give it a service with you watching or even see mm -hmm. if they'll let you do the service under their supervision um just learn the basics, really. Uh, languages, I'm absolutely useless at languages. Judy is absolutely fantastic at languages. She's fluent in German and Spanish. And she does a little bit of, she says she can't speak French and then we'll go to her, go into book something and she'll just gabble away in French perfectly. So she, she does very much the language side of things. I very much do the mechanics and maintenance. But 
Yeah, I think that's it. A lot of people plan the trip from the, oh, I'm going to go to this country. This is great. I'm going to go and see this. But don't forget your vehicle. It's, it's, it's your enabling factor. And if you can keep on top of it, it can save you a lot of money doing your own maintenance. Alexander, dailies are built quite high compared to the width of the vehicle. Does that lead to problems in the terrain? Because the, because the width, of, sorry, the length of the vehicle is not too bad. The width is okay, but it's much higher. Have you found any issues with that? Yeah, I mean, the basic chassis, when you when you get the chassis cab out of the factory, it's cleared to uh, 40 degrees, which is a lot. I think a Land Rover is cleared to 30 degrees. Um, I I would be very frightened. I, I think that's a static angle. I don't think you could actually drive it that. You'd hit the smallest pebble and you'd go over. Mm. We were going through a deep mud puddle um, at a slight angle, and someone had obviously put a plank or something in it, because when we were halfway through, it snapped and the vehicle rocked over. And using the dash cam, I measured we rocked over to 30 degrees. Wow. And then we came back up the right way again, um, which considering how tall we are, um, was it was scary at the time, but actually it's, it's quite reassuring that the, the vehicle's been well designed um, and the weight is all low down in the vehicle. So it's, it's, it's pretty stable. It, they do look, uh, and I, I get where the, where the guy is asking the question from, because they do look very high and they do look unstable, but actually they are, all the weight is, is really low down um, in the chassis and the axles and the fuel tanks are all down at chassis height. So it's, it's pretty stable. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Frank. Thank you very much indeed. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. So um, everyone, this will be up on my YouTube channel at some point, edited and annotated. And Marcus, thank you so much. Have you come to Australia yet? Is that on, have you done that one? It, it's on our list, actually. We were hoping after Canada to get across to New Zealand and Australia, but um, COVID's okay. kind well, of well, look, locked we, everything we, down. Yeah, we can't wait for you to be here. I know, you know a lot of people in Australia, so you have a lot, a lot of homes to visit there. So, um, yeah, I hope to see you over here soon. So thank you very much indeed. And, um, yeah, best of luck travelling and um, watch for the recording on my YouTube soon. Thanks a lot. Nice to chat to you. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye.